can see. Okay, so get this right there. I was 1982, all alone in Hawaii. Um, I was I was on the way to the Philippines to install this this giant radar that I helped design at GE, and I thought it'd be fun to, uh, on on the way to stop in, in Hawaii for a few days as I was going to the Philippines. Um, and just do some sightseeing. You know, I wanted to go see Pearl Harbor, and, and I drove around the island, and I got a real bad sunburn while I was laying on the beach. Um, but I also went to church. How's that for a website for your church, huh? <laughs> it looks a little different than uh, ours. Um, so the, the Pearl Harbor Church of Christ. Um, and while I was there, there was something in the message that just stuck with me for these 40 years. And, and frankly, it scared me a little bit. And, and I thought, well, you know, I've always thought in the back of my mind, someday I'm going to use those ideas to, um, and, and scare, I mean, I mean share, share with you guys as well. So I thought maybe this should be a Halloween sermon. You know? <laughs> no, it's not like that. So just, I'm going to start off. Here's, here's the crux of the idea anyway. On Judgment Day... What do you want God to think of you? As a religious person, you know, not bad. I is one, right? <laughs> a person that overcame sin. You know, I think I'm that too as well. Um, both? Something else? So I want to start off first with the religious person. Now, Here's one of the verses in that sermon in Hawaii that, that scared me a little bit. You know, Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about religious people, at least I think so. And so Matthew 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, those are religious people, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, this is Judgment Day. Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these great things? Didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. How can that be? Didn't they sound like you know, super religious people? Look what they did. Um, they're sort of at the top of their religious game with all those things, right? Uh, shouldn't they have been told, welcome to heaven? I bet they were really surprised, because instead what they got was, I, I never knew you, away from me, you evildoers. So that scared me when I read that as a young Christian and heard that at that sermon. Look at another group, the Jewish religious leaders. You know, they, they were voted most likely to get into heaven by the Jews of the first century anyway. Um, so what, did, what did Jesus say about them? Woe to you! Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your stuff, your spice and your mint and your dill and your cumin, but you neglect the more important matters of, lo of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Ouch. And they were the best of God's chosen people. They must have been shocked when and Jesus said that to them. And unfortunately, I think it's possible that we can get caught up in the same trap as the Jewish religious leaders and focus on religious practice and not people, right? They were focused on Jesus read all that. They gave a tenth about all that stuff. But they didn't give a hoot about the people. You know, we can get into that trap. Well, I'm going to the right church every Sunday, and I'm following the right doctrine and tithing, and I read the Bible every day, and I can quote scripture. I'm a really religious person. But as Jesus said, it's possible you're focused on the gnats and neglecting more important matters 
the people. You probably heard stories of churches arguing and breaking up over silly disagreements and minor doctrinal issues. You know, you never hear of church members disagreeing on the big things, like the need to help the homeless, feed the hungry. No. They'll, they'll, they'll focus and argue over the gnats, a minor Bible interpretation, and they're willing to do battle over that. It, it, this is weird that they even have them, but if you read online reviews of churches, just like you of restaurants, right? They have online reviews of churches. You see visitors often saying, often, sometimes saying, I'm never going to go there again. That church just focuses on petty little things um, like they worship the right way and all the other churches worship the wrong way. And sadly, you know, last night I was looking around and trying to find pictures of the, of the Pearl Harbor Church, and there were a few reviews about them written that way. Hopefully they're not true. You see, getting doctrines right and good, and, and I was, I'm all for the right doctrine, but like the Pharisees, it shouldn't be our only focus. Not what we're known for. Most people, for most people, especially those on the outside looking in at our church, that's just a gnat. And, and it can turn them off. And like I said, I, I've seen it in, in people's writings and reviews. And, and now thinking, and I think I might have even heard this in, in um, a pod, podcast of all things, that could be one of the reasons, there's several, but that could be one of the reasons many young people across the country have stopped going to church. They see churches as being inwardly focused and argumentative and worried about doctrinal gnats and, and minor differences instead of being outward focused and helping people. Doing religion right, but doing life wrong. That's what many young people claim we're doing. I'm not saying, just, not saying about us. I'm saying in general what religious people are doing. And that's what Jesus accused the Pharisees of, right? I pray we'll never get that way. I pray that instead we're known, and I think we are, but we're known as being an outwardly focused church. And not just our church, but each of us as individuals as well. That we're known as people that help and serve and give to others. So that's one idea. That just being religious isn't what God wants us to focus on. It's, it's outward and it's people. Let's move on to the other. That this, this focus on eliminating sin, which we need to do, right? <laughs> I mean, we need to do. Um, and it's good to stop doing all the thou shall nots. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's the top ten list, right? And what, eight of them are thou shall nots. Um, you know, so you become a Christian, you, you stop robbing banks, and you haven't killed anybody, and, uh, and, and you don't covet your, your neighbor's donkey anymore. Um, check those babies off, you're all set, right? Well, not quite. We also need to focus on and work on the thou shalls, which aren't on that list. I forgot to click the clicker, right? We checked all those guys off. The thou shalls. All the good things that we should be doing, along with getting rid of all the bad things that we need to stop with. Re remember when the rich young guy um, asked Jesus, Jesus, how do, how do I get in heaven? He probably had everything else, like the Ferrari there, right? H how do I get into heaven? What did Jesus say to him? Hey, you, you know the commandments, right? Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother. So the rich guy said, wow, great. All these I've kept since I was a boy, I'm in. 
when Jesus heard this, he said to him, well, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then you're going to have treasure in heaven. Then, then, then come follow me. <laughs> of course, you know, the rich guy walked away sad, couldn't do that. The rich guy won half the battle, right? He obeyed the thou shall not. He, he got those out of his life. You know, but I'm thinking, you know, if, if you're rich, <laughs> maybe it's not that hard to check those boxes off. You know, don't steal. I don't need to, right? I'm loaded. I, I, just a thought. <laughs> so maybe, like many of us, this rich guy was making sure he was good and he was obeying the rules and he wasn't sinning the best that he could, but he forgot to look outwards. He forgot to use all these blessings that God gave him to bless others. And so Jesus reminded him of that. And maybe he was just a little self-centered and inward-focused as well. So Jesus says to him, you know, what, well, what about the poor? You got the other things checked off, thou shalt not this and thou shalt not that, but what about the poor? How about giving some of your wealth to the poor? All your wealth to the poor. That's a lot harder for the rich guy. <laughs> That's a lot harder. All right. Here's another more famous example that even people that don't read the Bible sort of know. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, he wasn't an expert in traffic law. He was an expert in Bible rules. Um, and he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Same question that the rich guy asked, right? So Jesus says, well, well what's written? Uh, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God. This is the expert talking. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Go do it, and you'll live. So Jesus gives this guy just, just two things to do. Right? Love God, love your neighbor. And I think just like the rich guy, one of them was easy for him. In, in, in his, this case, loving God. Remember, this, this guy was like a religious big shot, right? Um, he was a Bible expert. In fact, that was his title. Uh, and so he's thinking, golden, right? I got that box checked. I love God. But hmm, this loving my neighbor thing, that, that's, that's a lot harder. So he tries to find a loophole, right? He tries to find a loophole with Jesus. He goes, but... So the Bible says, you know, he wanted to justify himself, and he asked Jesus, um, what about my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? The expert asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? So here's, here's what Jesus says. And we know this is the, the Good Samaritan story. Jesus said, well, all right, let me tell you. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and, and went away, and leaving him half dead. So, a priest happened to be going down that same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Left him there. So, too, a Levite, when he came to that place where the man was, he saw him and went to the other side of the road as well, walked right past him. Took no pity on him. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him... He took pity on him, and he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds and poured on, on oil and wine, and he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took, took out two pieces of silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper, said, look after this guy. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expenses you might have. So Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. It sort of turns the table on the expert in the law. The expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him, of course. Jesus said, well, and then you go do the same thing. This, this parable is just a, a, a brilliant answer to the expert's uh, loophole question, isn't it? You know, the, the, the Good Samaritan parable. Um, and most people don't realize 
that the Samaritans weren't considered good. We call them good today. They got, they got good marketing now, right? There's good Samaritan hospitals and all kinds of good Samaritan stuff, right? But back then, they weren't the good Samaritans. They were the bad Samaritans, at least in the Jewish, uh, the eyes of the Jewish people. So maybe this parable should be called the bad religious people versus the good Samaritan, right? We should, because in the parable, the super religious Jewish guys, the priest and the Levite, right? They're, they were the Jewish leaders, religious leaders. Those guys, they didn't help the poor Jew. It was a fellow Jew. They didn't help him. No, nope, no, nope, this, this bad guy um, that they hated, he was the helper. Those religious Jews, those super people, they were only concerned with themselves, right? Self-centered, inward focus. They had a blessed life. Those two guys were probably at the top of the social ladder, priest and the Levite, but, but they couldn't find it in themselves to take the time or the effort to bless a fellow Jew. Instead, instead a Samaritan, someone the Jews hated, had the compassion and, and sacrificed his time and money to help. And Jesus says, well, that, that's what we need to do also. It's not just being able to say you love God, which those two Jewish leaders must have done. They, they, I'm sure they love God. Or, or that you obey God. Again, those Jewish leaders must have obeyed God as best they could. But those guys that claim that, they just kept walking by in the parable story. The parable teaches us that it takes effort and sacrifice and doing things we would rather not do to fully be a child of God. It's a sacrifice, it really is. It's a sacrifice to be a blessing to others. It's looking outward, again, versus looking inward. Here's what the Apostle John said. He said, you know, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Sacrifice. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in them? So, dear children, let's not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So John says, if God's blessed you in any way, you need to be a blessing to others. Right? That's, that's what he's saying. You've got to be a blessing to others. And not just with lip service. He ends up with that. All right? It's, it's got to be some actions. Okay. But the, the scripture reading Charles read, we heard the good part of the sheep and the goat judgment story. And again, there was another scripture that was read when I was in Hawaii that sort of scared me a bit. And in, in that, Jesus says, the, the part that Charles read, he said to the sheep on his right, come, take your inheritance. That's the good part of the story. Now, it's time to hear the not so good part, the part with the goats. Again, from the Sermon on the Mount. No, no, it's not the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 25. So then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Yuck. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I, I, I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. And I was sick and in prison. You didn't look after me. And those people will also answer, well, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help you? They're, they're, they're probably thinking, man, if I would have saw the Lord, I would certainly have helped him, wouldn't I? But he'll reply, the judge is going to reply, I, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these you know, when, whatever you didn't do for other people, you didn't do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Sort of scary, right? These people were shocked that they didn't make the cut. 
Right? They, they were probably good people. Right? They, they didn't hurt anyone. They obeyed the rules. They tried their best not to sin. They kept to themselves. Oh, maybe that's, maybe that's the problem. They kept to themselves. They didn't seem to have helped anyone. Jesus said, yeah, you, you guys had all kinds of opportunities to serve other people and, you know, by extension, to serve me. You had all kinds of opportunities but you didn't do it. It wasn't for the bad things that they committed that they were condemned for. It was for the good things that they didn't do. I'll say it again. It's for the good things that they didn't do. Remember the, the thing that James said, right? Anyone who, then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And we know a lot of good things we should be doing, right? Um, you know, so when, when Jesus rattled off all these things, you know, helping the poor and the sick and the, those in prison, I'm thinking to myself, have I been doing that? Have I been going out of my way to help all of these people? The thirsty and the hungry and those needing clothes. And we can't be like the bad religious guys in the Good Samaritan story, right? That just walk on the other side of the road and think, man, I'm too busy. They're, they're probably thinking, I, I, I got to get to the synagogue. Right? I'm too busy. I can't be bothered with this. Point. I want to nah, I wanna help them, but no, nah, I can't. It's, Someone else, someone else will take care of him. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he probably already called somebody on his cell phone. There's someone coming, yeah. Right, Do those thoughts sort of go through our heads sometimes when you see people in need. We can't just be like monks that are sort of cloistered up in our safe little sheltered world, being good, but not helping anyone. Not being a blessing to others. Jesus says those kinds of people are goats. Here's another thing, though. If you say, well, I, I, I never run across these opportunities to do good. You know, Jesus listed all those things, but I don't run into those kinds of people. Well, here, here's what God says. The Apostle Paul wrote this in the Ephesians letter. He says, we're God's workmanship. That's good. And we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Yeah, I, I know that. But here's a kicker, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <laughs> Right? God's making sure that we're going to run into these situations, that we're going to have these opportunities, that we're going to run into people that need help. He prepared those things in advance for us to do. So we're out of excuses. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't have any gifts. What can I do to help others? I don't have any money to give. I don't have any talents. I don't even have much of my health left anymore. You know? Could be thinking that. So I, I was thinking the other day when we were helping people move, and, and we've been doing this like a, a what, David, once a month, uh, every two, two weeks lately, helping people move. Um, and I was thinking, you know, yeah, um, there's not many people that can lift a couch. <laughs> um, a lot of us can't and, and move these big, heavy things. But... You could move a little box, right? Or maybe you can pack up some of the odds and ends that, that need to be put into the little box. Or, or you can help clean the apartment after the person moves out, because that always needs to be done. Or help put some of the dishes away um, into the new place. Um, you know, we have sometimes like seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds come and help move. And if they can, and they're a big help, believe it or not. And if they can do it, uh, I think some of us can. And if that isn't even possible, and something for some of us, we're not even able to do that, you know, pick up the little boxes and stuff, and we're, you know, in, in such bad health and shape and need to stay home, that's fine. But even there, there's, there's things we can be doing, and, and some of you are really good at it. Um, 
cards and letters of encouragement you can write, calls you can make, even text messages. I get those from Sam every now and then. Um, you can be creative. Um, visits to people if you can. Just ask God. He said he prepared these things for us in advance. Ask him. Um, what do you want me to do today, God? What do you want me to do? How could I be a blessing? Okay. Let's close. So my goal here is just to encourage us to be a blessing to as many people as we can. The other things are necessary and important and right, you know? Having our doctrine right. Getting all the sin out of our life as we can. Being good people. But those are like two legs of the stool. And the third leg of the stool is being a blessing to others. Those two, were, you know, try, we're, we're working on ourselves. And the third, the third part of the, the, what God wants us to be doing here on earth is helping others. We can't just do what we want to do all the time. You know, we, we have to do what we ought to do, <laughs> what God wants. Think about it. What do you do with your free time? Do you volunteer either here at church or at some other organization that does good? When we get in front of God on Judgment Day and he asks, how did we spend our time, what are we going to say? Well, I really liked watching those TV shows, God. Um, I spent a lot of time in my hobbies. I read a lot of good books. I, you know, I, I worked like a crazy person to support the family, but when I wasn't working, I made sure to devote some time to exercise, you know, keep my health up. You think God's going to say, well, well done, good and faithful servant. Knocked off those TV shows. <laughs> no. All that stuff's sort of inward focused, isn't it? And even if you cap off your list with, oh, yeah, and, and I read the Bible every day. But what about helping others? And this is maybe a strange connection, but I, I think this is one of the reasons why God wants us to get together every Sunday. To see how each of us are doing and what our needs are. You know, how can we support each other and help each other and be outwardly focused if we don't know how each of us are doing? And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, or at least, at least to the audience uh, that are here at church, but it's possible that someday some of us might be tempted to withdraw, um, to stay home, to just do what we want to do on, on a Sunday for a change, you might be thinking. And, and it saddens me when people say, well, you know, I, I just don't get anything out of going to church. Okay, did God promise you that you're going to get something? Were you expecting a participation ribbon or a gold star or a free donut? Right? We aren't here to get, right? I, we're here to give. That's the whole point of getting together. To praise God, that's giving, right? To praise and worship God and to give to help to others that might need it. And I think that's why God called us to get together every Sunday, is for that second part, you know, to help each other, to better know each other, what our needs might be, and how we can be a benefit, a blessing. Think about it. You can, you can worship God at home, right? And people often say that, I, I can worship God at home, and I can pray, and I can read my Bible. Just be at home. But you're just checking the religious box. Aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm a religious person. I'm, I'm doing these things. You're being good. You're not doing the thou shall nots. That's great. But just like the rich guy and the Bible expert that we read about, you're only doing half of what God wants, or two-thirds. Jesus said, one thing you lack, how are you helping others? By staying home. How are you being a blessing that God wants you to be. I think being part of a church family fosters that idea of being a blessing to others. It gives us opportunities, right? Uh, whether they're organized opportunities or just we bump into people that need help. Opportunities to be a blessing to do good. So, let's not be like the Pharisees and stand, just stand in our correct doctrine. 
or like the rich guy and just claim to live a clean life. In both cases, those guys got turned away from the pearly gates. Let's be like the Good Samaritan. We go out of our way to be a blessing to others. It requires sacrifice and effort and doing something that's uncomfortable, something you'd rather not do. Right? The Good Samaritan, I'm sure, didn't want to stop and get this Jew that didn't like him and put him on his donkey and go pay for his treatment. But that's what you got to do to be a blessing. I'm going to leave you with this true story. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read what was in the article. These aren't my words. It says, after seeing this barefoot homeless man on the street, a young man in the, in the blackjack decided to give him a pair of new shoes. Though they didn't know each other, he treated the homeless man like a true friend. friend. And the moment they share on the sidewalk is too beautiful for words. You, you can tell they're sharing something deeply emotional and deeply human. You can see it on their faces. And as the reality of the gesture from this good Samaritan finally hits home, the young homeless man breaks down completely. His reaction stemmed from the reality that someone took their time and money to do something so selfless for him. While thousands of acts of kindness like this never get captured on camera, it's refreshing to see a genuine one like this be exposed to the world. It reminds us of this. In the midst of tragedy and heartache, our world can still be great <laughs> with simple love lived out like this. Neat story. So, when we go to bed each night, let's think about who can I, who did I help today? Who have I blessed today? And how can I be a blessing to others? Sermon's yours. Do with it as you please.